32 teams in 32 days. This is episode 13, the Los Angeles Chargers episode. Let's welcome in Fernando Ramirez, Chargers reporter for Sports Illustrated. Fernando, what's going on? Hey, man, I'm good. Thank you for having me on. It's a, it's an exciting time. I mean, it's that time where free agency is kind of over for a little bit, and then you're kind of waiting for the draft. There's a lot of stuff coming out. You just don't know what to make uh, heads and tails of it, but it's a fun time, honestly. You in L.A. right now? No, I actually live in San Diego. Okay, I, uh, okay. I commute uh, whenever there's a game, whenever it's practice, whatever. I just drive up. It's a, honestly being in California. I can't complain. Uh, driving up from San Diego to to Costa Mesa and back down. It's a beautiful, beautiful scenery um, drive. So I love it. So I can't complain about it. Yeah. Uh, so when when the team moved a, a couple of years ago, what were your thoughts? Because obviously, you know, people were in San Diego were upset and leaving you know, Qualcomm and, and all that and them coming to yeah. LA with, with a new stadium. What were your thoughts on, you know, when, when they no, moved? Well, it's funny because at 7 a.m., I remember the, they had just played Kansas City. They lost. Um, and the next morning I was told, hey, be at Chargers uh, Park at, at 7 a.m. And I got there at 7 a.m. waiting, waiting. There were Charger fans there waiting to see what was going to happen, everything. And I remember I opened my phone, at, or maybe this was a week later. I can't remember. No, it was – yeah, it was a couple of days after that game, sorry. But I was just told, be there at uh, at a certain time. So I remember I was there, and there were some Charger fans there, and I look at my phone, and I get an email saying, uh, President Dean Spanos will be moving the team to Los Angeles. And I was like, whoa. And then I just see fans crying, all this stuff. Then fans start showing up. They start dropping their jerseys. They start dropping their stuff. This guy comes up, lights it on fire, and I'm like, "Whoa, what is going on?" So it was, it was a, it was a crazy time. I mean, I know some. It's funny because I feel like some fans, if they weren't, if they didn't move with the team, they still kind of held a little bit of hope with the team, and then they make that playoff run. And yeah. um, they in 2018, I feel like some fans came back. And there's still some fan. I mean, I have family members who are still fans of the organization. They're still fans of the, of the team and everything, and they're still following it. And I know a lot of people that are. Some people are, are over it, and they're kind of like whatevers. But, um, but yeah, no, my feeling was I was surprised that he did it. But at the same time, I just thought in L.A., man, I mean, the, the, the price of your team goes up. So it, I think it shot up. I think now they're at $2.8 billion, if I'm not uh, mistaken, or almost $3 billion. So – I mean, it, it, it pays to, to have a team in Los Angeles, to be honest. Yeah, and, you know, COVID's not, not ending, but, you know, coming coming down, perfect time. Because playing first first stadium and like, first season with, with the new stadium with no fans must have sucked, especially, you know, covering the team. And hopefully they're going to, you know, have that thing 75 80%. That's the, that's the plan right now. But uh, I know when I'm back in L.A., I, I want to see that stadium pretty bad. <laughs> Yeah, I know. And, and honestly, my first time going to the stadium la was last year. Around this time, uh, WrestleMania 37 had been announced. Yeah, uh, I was there covering the event. And I mean, we got to interview Roman Reigns, Becky Lynch and and Stephanie McMahon. And I'm walking around. I'm looking at the stadium. I'm like, wow, this thing is going to be incredible. And then we walk. I did a stadium tour in August uh, with Eric Williams, who also cover, covers the Rams for us. And we're walking around, we're like, wow, I cannot believe this stadium's about to be empty this whole season. And the stadium's incredible. I mean, fans are going to love it. Um, so I, I'm, we're walking around, we're like, wow, like this is, this stadium should be packed with fans. The games, I'm not going to lie, the games at times got a little bit boring just because, not because of the action or anything, but because you don't feel the, the rumble, but uh, like you don't feel the mini earthquake from fans like stomping and getting all excited and stuff. So it was kind of like, oh, like it left you desiring more or wanting more because there were no fans in it. And I went to Cincinnati. I only traveled, I traveled to Cincinnati and I traveled to Las Vegas this year. And those two games, I mean, no fans either. So uh, it, it did leave you more or something more to desire. But honestly, when they get fans in there, it's going to get, uh, it's going to get exciting. Yeah. And, and it's funny. I was, uh, because you mentioned WrestleMania and, and Raymond James is hosting WrestleMania this year. They host the Super Bowl this year. So SoFi uh, is going to become the only the second stadium and it's, it's, it's only been around for less than a year and a half. It's, it's going to become the second stadium to, or, sorry, third stadium to host both WrestleMania and the Super Bowl. Only Raymond James, SoFi, and then uh, New Orleans. 
So yeah. already, like you can feel the excitement. Then you have the Olympics coming in a couple of years. Like you can already feel the excitement uh, okay. down in LA. No, 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 it's 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 getting exciting. And I know this year they're going to be hosting the Super Bowl. Hopefully by that time it gets a little bit, um, it gets a little bit, uh, they're allowing fans and, and there can be a lot more of a, of a Super Bowl buzz. Cause I mean, some of the, I, I didn't end up going this year to Tampa Bay, but some, from some of the other journalists that I talked to, they said it was pretty dead down there. So hopefully this year we can have a little bit more fun during the Super Bowl. And it, it sucks because it was supposed to be WrestleMania this year and then the Super Bowl next year. And now the WrestleMania got jumped, I think two more or so. Next year, it's going to be in Dallas, and then the year after, the WrestleMania 39 is going to be in Los Angeles. So it, it's going to be very interesting to see what um, what happens with all of that. But it, it's a fun time to be in L.A. I mean, the World Cup is going to be a lot of fun. Obviously, by that time, unfortunately, no Ronaldo, no Messi, most likely. So unless a miracle happens in science and, and they're turned into robots or we find out that they're just uh, different, they're from a different planet, uh, but the Olympics is going to be fun. All that stuff is going to be a lot of fun. So sure. LA is in for a huge party for the next uh, couple of years. Yeah. So Chargers, a lot, lot of stuff to talk about. It was a productive free agency for the Bolts centered around a certain theme protecting Justin Herbert, of course. The rookie of the year showed out in 15 games last year, bringing in Corey Lindsley, all pro center, one of the best in the league. Matt Filer, very productive guard as well, locking up the interior of the line with room to still improve at the tackle position very stacked tackle class in the draft. Uh, overall, what do you think of these two acquisitions? Well, when we talk about the Corey Lindsley, it's funny because uh, there's only one offensive lineman left from last year, a starter. Uh, Sam Tevy's gone, Dan Feeney gone, and today Forrest Lamp signed with, uh, with the Buffalo Bills. Bri uh, Trey Turner was cut. Brian Bulaga actually was a huge reason why Corey Lindsley came to the Chargers. Uh, Brian Bulaga and him were teammates for numerous years with the Green Bay Packers. And <clears throat> after the Green Bay Packers had told him, hey, man, we're not going to be able to resign you because Green Bay has a lot of money invested elsewhere. Uh, he was looking around. I know that San Francisco and Arizona were two teams that, uh, to keep an eye on. But he said that as soon as Brian Bulaga, and this is the interesting part about the whole thing, is that Brian Bulaga doesn't know what uh, Brandon Staley's bringing to the team. He doesn't know what Vince Lombardi's or Vince Lombardi. I keep on doing that. Joe Lombardi. What Joe Lombardi is going to do with the with the offense? But they have a vision, and Brian Bulaga trusted that vision, and he explained it to Corey Lindsley. Hey, this is the vision that these guys have. I believe in it. I feel like you should too. So he was able to bring him in, and uh, and so that was a huge acquisition, just because. To me, the two, the three most important positions on the offense as a whole is center, left tackle, and the quarterback. If you have all three of those things, then you're going to have a pretty good offense. Um, what was the second part that you asked me? Filer, not Filer. Filer. Oh, he just looks like a rugged, big, like mountain man kind of dude. And he was just excited. He kept on talking about how he how he he can't wait to go get uh to go and and compete for justin and block for justin but the other thing that he said is he's going from a pro bowl to all pro center in more uh in uh marquise pouncey to now going with corey lindsley so he said when you have a, an all pro center everything is simplified for you. So he was very excited about working with Corey Lindsley. So it's going to be interesting to see the way this whole offensive line dynamic goes, but you said it, I mean, there's a theme going with these chargers and they decided, Hey, we need offensive line help and we need it bad. So that's what they did. And you know, what's funny is that O'Day, uh, Abuji, Abuji, um, he's one of the guys that he did not start the first eight weeks of the season last year. And then the Lions, I think they had an injury and they decided to throw O'Day in there. And O'Day had a very good last eight games of the season. So he's a he's one of those, Tom Telesco every year has an underrated signing that maybe they give him a one-year contract and it's not that expensive, but he ends up uh, exceeding expectations. So I see O'Day as one of those guys. I think he's going to be the right guard unless the Chargers draft somebody, but it seems like he's going to be the right guard. Look for him to be one of those underrated signings that Tom Telesco uh, usually has. So new head coach, Brendan Staley, you touched on it just a little bit. I think if you asked a lot of Chargers fans before the hiring, like a, you know early January or late December, right when the season ended, right when the, the, the coaching carousel was heating up, I, I think if you asked a lot of Chargers fans, 
they would all have told you Brian Dable, Brian Dable, Brian Dable, but they hire the, the young defensive mind, Brandon Staley, that they go a complete different direction than what most people were expecting. Uh, they got him from the other LA team, took over for Wade Phillips and did a really good job. What were your initial thoughts on the hiring and what changes do you see him bringing to the team? So it's funny because um, I have a podcast with one of my fellow uh, beat writers. His name is Gilbert Manzano. It's called Gompas on the Beat. And I remember before, like we were starting to put together this podcast and everything. And it was right around the time where the Chargers were trying to hire their coach. And he says, bro, I think it's going to be Brian Dable. And I'm like, dude, no. He's like, why not? That's the obvious choice. I'm like, there, you said it. Obvious. This team does not go. Like the obvious choice is not what these guys are going to do. I'm like, they always go some way, somewhere. And honestly, I didn't believe the Urban Meyer stuff. I thought he used them as leverage a little bit. To, right. To, um, I'm sure they made a call and kind of like, were like, hey, they, you know what? They stuck their toe in the pool to see what was in the pool, how cold it was, how hot it was. So um, I definitely think that that was out of the window, but I just didn't think they were going to go with Brian Dable just because one, it was taking too long in a sense, but two, you can't, you can't pass up a guy like Brandon Staley. He has been one of those coaching guys that has been on the rise and he's quickly made his name uh, uh, real. Like he literally went from being an outside linebackers coach with Chicago. And in three years, he's already a head coach. So he's one of those guys that um, he's one of those guys that you look at and you're like, mm, I don't know. So it's going to be very interesting to see the way Brandon comes in. Now, Brandon, I think what really sold a lot of people on him and it sold me, Jalen Ramsey, you know, Jalen Ramsey. I mean, Jalen doesn't come out and, and he doesn't like when he compliments you, damn, like, and I'm sorry if I can't say damn, but wow. So, uh, so he came out and he complimented uh, him, calling him the best defensive coordinator he's ever had. Now, the way it's been explained to me is the way he does this is he'll come into the meeting room and he'll ask, uh, he'll ask you, be like, Jake, what did you see when you were out there from Julio Jones? No, well, the last time I saw, and you explained to the rest of the group what you saw and everything. So he wants, he wants to listen. So he says what he does is he takes a step back and he listens to the players to see what they're seeing on film, what they're seeing from, uh, from their coaches and from the opposing players. So he really likes everybody to have a voice in that room, which is, is huge. I mean, sometimes you come in and, and they tell you, this is the system we're going to run. No excuses, blah, 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 whatever. We asked him, what are you going to do with Justin Herbert? He said, we're going to fit him. We're going to fit the system around him. What does that mean? That means they're going to take what Justin liked from last year. They're going to sprinkle in some New Orleans, some Green Bay Packers, some uh, San Francisco 49 ers stuff and really build the offense around them. If you notice all the offensive coaches that the Chargers got, they're from the three high powered offenses of New Orleans, Green Bay and um, and San Francisco. So literally what they did is they they just built it. They're going to build this offense around Justin, which is smart. And you don't see a lot of coaches do that, especially offensive minded head coaches. They come in and they tell you what they want to run. And honestly, the last time the Chargers hired a defensive minded coach, they had their best record in franchise history under Marty Schottenheimer, rest in peace, uh, 14 and two. They had a stack team. So it's really going to be interesting to see the way that Brandon Saley operates this and the way he kind of handles everything. So he also handled a defensive coordinator in Ronaldo Hill from, from Denver. And really it's going to be interesting to see the way they put all these pieces together and see what they do with this offense and this defense and how Brandon uh, shapes this team in his image. Yeah. So now a kind of two part question going, going into Justin Herbert. Most people don't know this. This is going to be his fifth offensive coordinator in five years. And also, um, I, I think it's very underrated what Pep Hamilton did for him last year. He's uh, obviously out the door. What do you think about him leaving and how, and how hard do you think it's going to be for Justin to adjust to another new offensive coordinator? Well, it's also Justin's fourth head coach in five years. So it's really interesting to see the way that, that he's done this. Now I've spoken to people close to, to Justin and everything. And, and people say that he's a smart kid that picks stuff up quickly. So yeah. the thing is, yeah. Justin is such a smart guy. He's going to understand this quickly. He'll pick up the offense quickly. The only thing is, can you have a complex offense to, in a sense, not bore him? I mean, that's basically how it gets and how it is. So 
I, I think Justin will be fine. I mean, Justin is a smart guy. He really last year in a in a year where the team wasn't that good, the offensive line was not good at it was below average. He was able to score 36 touchdowns and really pick up on a lot of things that you really will look at and be like, wow, this kid really did this. He he put up three touchdowns against the Super Bowl, uh, the Super Bowl champions. He yeah. had them against the ropes. It was just the defense at the end couldn't um they couldn't defend tom brady and he just went crazy but he he put up the three against them put up four touchdowns against uh the new orleans saints and really made his mark across the season so it's going to be really interesting to see the way um the way justin develops under now uh joe lombardi and, and this offense but i think the Chargers are going to be fine pep hamilton did do a great job now pep is in houston but i really do think that the chargers are going to be that he's going to be fine he'll pick up this offense and really, um, with this new offensive line, we may see Justin's numbers balloon even more this upcoming season, uh, especially if they get him a couple. Of, I still think the Chargers need to get him a couple more weapons on offense. I know he has Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, and he has uh, Jared Cook and, and Austin Eckler, but I still feel like the Chargers are a couple of weapons away from this offense really being lethal. So th- th- this is really the mold in the NFL is year two quarterbacks. It's when Russell Wilson broke out. It's when Lamar Jackson broke out. Patrick Mahomes broke out technically in year two, even though it was, it was his first year starting. Yeah. But what do the Chargers need to do to make it back to the playoffs and really this pop year that, that, that all these, these star quarterbacks have in year two? What do they need to do to make it great for Justin Herbert? They're already doing it, man. They're getting him that offensive line. They're getting him that help. Now, Here's the thing, and I'm sure you were going to ask me about this, but I'm going to jump the gun and I'm going to beat you to it. Uh, they need to get him a left tackle. That's literally what is missing. And it's funny because I talked to Panay Sewell on, on Monday and I asked him about possibly playing with Justin. Man, he had a twinkle in his eye. And he said, I that would love you? to play with her. That was you? That quote that yeah. came out of yeah, yeah, yeah. about it? <laughs> yeah, I, I had to ask him. So I was like, hey, like, what would it mean? And man, he had a twinkle in his eye. He got excited and he said, I would love to play with Herb. So honestly, it, it I, I think that the Chargers, if Panay drops, because this is what I think is going to happen. Four quarterbacks are going to be taken with the first four picks. That's just my prediction. And then we're going to start seeing a scramble. If Cincinnati takes Jamar Chase, crap is going to hit the fan. So I don't go even more and say a four-letter word that my mother wouldn't approve of. But it's going to hit the fan. I think stuff is going to go crazy. I wouldn't be surprised if the Chargers jumped up and grabbed Panay Sewell or Rashawn Slater. I just think Panay, if you really had Panay and you had Justin, you have that connection. He only gave up two quarterback hurries. And that's why I had to ask him on Monday, man, what would it mean for you, for your, like your last college start, you were protecting Justin Herbert in the Rose Bowl. What would it mean to now protect Justin in the NFL? That's why he got so hyped. So I think the Chargers really, if they jump up and they grab a first, uh, an offensive lineman in the first round, a left tackle especially, I just think that they would solidify this offensive line and they'd be ready. Now, obviously, you go for depth after that because Brian Bulaga was hurt last year numerous times. You have to account for injuries. So I feel like the Chargers need to have really good backups just in case. But I really think that combining all that would would just be killer for them. Um, I'm really, and I think they still need to add a third receiver. They need speed. That is the one thing that this Chargers offense is, is, is lacking. They don't have speed. So I really am looking forward to seeing if they if they cinch up. It's funny because going back to when I talked to Gilbert, I, I, I mess with him and I'm like, Jalen Waddle in this offense, man, that would be crazy. It's like, bro, you need a left tackle or a corner. I'm like, yeah, but imagine Jalen Waddle on this offense and we just have fun with it. But but literally, I mean, I, I just imagine Jalen Waddle on this offense and I think he would erupt. Henry Ruggs, that's why last year, if you see him with the Raiders, he didn't really, he, he had some good games, but he had some games where he was non-existent. Why? Because the Raiders have no other receiver help. If Henry Ruggs was on the Chargers, hell, I think the Chargers would have three 1,000-yard receivers on their team. So I think the Chargers still need to add some speed to this offense. I still think they need another running back. Um, I think they need a bigger back. Najee Harris on this offense, man, that would be that would be killer for them. They could, I, I really think that this offense kind of missed Melvin Gordon in a sense last year. I know people won't say it, but when you have a thumper and you have a, a guy that's really fast like like Austin Eckler, it really changes a lot. So 
it's going to be interesting to see what ways the charge obviously i'm not i'm not in the chargers draft room or anything but it's going to be really interesting to see what way they're able to um to put that around justin now speed left tackle and another running back and your offense is set and ready to go if only you were uh you were calling coward in the the, the Chargers draft room a couple Dude, years ago, I remember. <laughs> when, he got, when he got that opportunity, I was like, wow, that is awesome. Like, I would love to be able to sit in. And honestly, I'd be a fly on the wall. Just give me, I mean, a couple of stand, finger sandwiches and I'll be good in the, uh, give me something to drink and I'll be cool. Just watch. It has to be a, a complete show. Like, I honestly, and, and it's funny because last year they had to do it from their, from their living rooms and stuff. And, right. I wonder how, like, and the thing is, GMs, coaches, they'll play it off and be like, oh, no, it was easy. It was fine. BS. It had to have been a whirlwind. Having to be on the phone, having to be, because literally I heard they had monitors where they were on Zoom with every employee and all that. So it must have been a complete show to to, to do all that. Yeah. So you, uh, uh, you mentioned Sewell. And uh, as a Bengals fan, you don't know this. I didn't tell you. As a Bengals fan, uh, I hope he is in stripes. I uh, I am Team Sewell. Uh, I because you know the, the, I understand why. The, yeah, the the Chase connection with Burrow is it's whatever. But uh, I don't uh, I don't want to, to see him go anywhere because I, I look at the teams that 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 could potentially grab him. Miami, the Chargers. I mean. Those are the, are the teams that, that the Bengals are going to be compared to for the next couple of years is with Tua, with Herbert, with Burrow. Those three are, are going to be competing for the next, you know, seven, eight years as these, as this 2020 quarterback class. And I don't want Penny Sewell to go to Miami or the Chargers who, and, and I also agree if, if Sewell does fall, I'm interested to see where he goes because I think a team will trade up. I don't think Slater goes before Sewell. I know Daniel Jeremiah likes Slater more, but Penny Sewell is going to play his first game at 20 years old. In, in, in the NFL and that's so valuable to have that youth and a guy who dominated the Pac-12 for two years a lot of one sack and over 2,000 snaps just just make, makes any team better yeah no definitely and I mean the thing is is that I think there's a lot of I think that story got out that Bengal story on purpose yeah to... <laughs> excuse me sorry um I think that story got out on purpose to make teams think oh the Bengals might go Jamar Chase I, I really think after what they saw last year, and honestly, I think the Joe Burrow situation kind of prompted the Chargers. And I mean, I'm not saying that they looked at it and said, oh my God, we don't want Justin to get hurt and let's go offensive line. The Chargers knew they needed to fix the offensive line. But I think that moment kind of t- told them, hey, you know what? We need to protect this kid just in case. So I really do think that the, that the Bengals should go offensive line just because you want to protect Joe Burrow. You already have jo- did jo- Jonah Williams sat out last year, right? No, no, he played. He, he, he was actually okay, pretty good. Yeah. He was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, you you know what? My bad. I was thinking of somebody else. Yeah, no, no. no. Jonah was good. I remember watching him week one. Um, yeah. so Penay would probably what move to your right tackle. You'd have him solidified. Last year, I remember was it Bobby Hart? Bobby yeah. Hart was the was the the right tackle, and I remember in one of those, he said something to Joey, and Joey just lit up, and I think he, he hit Burrow in one of those. And he runs over. I know, and he I, I know exactly the play you're talking about. It was yeah. it was a play where where Bobby did Bobby didn't even even try to block him. Bosa just went yeah. right through the, and the then, B gap. I, I think it was, and then just destroyed. It, uh, yeah, no. Joe. Joey told us he said something to me. I went right past him. I hit his quarterback, and I ran back, and I told him something. And like I remember, I tweeted that out, and all these Bengal fans. I thought they were gonna get on me. Oh no, they got on Bobby Hart. They oh, no. were all over Bengals on fans Bobby hate Hart. Bobby Hart. They finally they finally released him. They they got Riley Reef. Sewell will probably play right guard in in year one because they signed oh, Reef to a, a one year contract. Um, yeah. Most of these most of these tackles will, will play guard. Maybe not Darius. He might be a little too big. But uh, Slater will play guard year one. Sewell will probably play guard year one just because they're all so young and, and they didn't play last year. And and See? oh my bad. Yeah, and and it's it, it's gonna be interesting too to see how these teams are going to scale and grade these players that didn't play last year. Are they gonna take them off their boards, or are they yeah. gonna still value that they're twenty and twenty one years old and take that youth? I, I, I over really that? do think I really think they're gonna value them like if they got hurt in a sense. Like, hey, maybe they got hurt in training and and boom, they sat out the year because of injury. So I think they're going to grade them fine. I think that they're going to still be fine. Now, the thing the thing I caution the Chargers with is not reaching. I right. think this year, if 
say that both Slater and um, Slater and Pene are gone, they can't reach for the offensive tackle position. Right. They need to look at other players. Um, the kid, the kid out of uh, USC makes sense. He's a guard. I mean, if you want to plug him into your right guard, I don't see him as a left tackle. I, I feel I like, know. I mean, maybe maybe the Chargers would, but I don't. And the Chargers also have a huge need at corner. I mean, you have a lot of very good corners. In my opinion, the best corner in this draft is J.C. Horn. And that's a, bu- a, a, a buddy of mine who, who does all this stuff and, and scouts and all this stuff. He told me, he's like, J.C. Horn is the best cornerback in this draft. If J.C. Horn is there, I'm I'm very interested to see what the Chargers do now. If there's a run on on offensive linemen and there's a run on on uh, on corners, and a guy like Devontae Smith is sitting there, Waddle, would the Chargers be enticed to select him? Now that's and honestly, like I'm telling you, fans get on me. Some of my fellow journalists get on me, but I I like to have fun, so I throw out the wacky scenario. So what if? What if Waddle's sitting there? Why wouldn't they go he up probably, and grab he, him? He probably will be. Waddle will I, probably be there at 13, I think. I'm telling you, I think there I, I think that would be too enticing. Like if, I'm saying if Panay is gone and so is um if Panay is gone and so is is Slater, and it's kind of like, oh, we don't really like what's going on around here, and they see Waddle sitting there. I, I think it's gonna be too hard not to take him. And honestly, Waddle. Keenan Allen and Mike Williams and Justin Herbert. Honestly, it's it's going to be raining footballs. I mean, what Justin scored thirty six touchdowns this year. He might score forty five to fifty next year if given the chance. But just back to reality, I I I really think they need to fix up the corner spot. They still have an edge rushing spot open on the other side. Uh, I look for them to to fix that in the draft as well. Um, and also, we have we can't. Uh, people are like, "Oh, are the Chargers done in free agency?" Remember, June first is that period where a lot of teams cut veteran players because uh, because they think, "Oh no, this guy doesn't have it." A couple of years ago, the Chargers got Brandon Flowers out of that. They were able to get cornerback Brandon Flowers. Brandon Flowers was a Pro Bowl corner for them for once for a couple of seasons, and he played well. So it's going to be a very interesting to see what the Chargers try and do to really fix the dynamic. I honestly was one of the ones that, and I'll admit this, I fell for, I thought uh, John Johnson was going to be a Charger. I thought Troy Hill, cornerback, I thought he might be a Charger. Why? Because of the connection with, with Brandon. And so I fell for it. I'll admit it. Uh, I thought one of them was going to be it. They're not. I think the Chargers also, in a sense, have a holes at safety. I think both safety positions, and you're going to look at me weird, but I think both positions at safety need to be addressed also in the draft a little bit, kind of bring some guys up. Why am I saying that? I think next year, Derwin James is going to be a positionless player. I think we're going to see Derwin at safety, at linebacker, at corner, at safety, back at defensive end. I think Derwin is going to be a positionless player next year. And Brandon, when when we asked him about Derwin, man, he he had a twin, he had that Panay Sewell twinkle in his eye. He was excited about. <laughs> yeah, what am I gonna do with like the things that I get to do with this guy? Exactly. Right? Because you know what? It's funny because I, and this is what was Eric Williams told me, who covers the Rams. He's like, he has his Jalen Ramsey and Derwin James. He has his Aaron Donald and Joey Bosa. But then Eric told me, now Derwin is more valuable in a sense because he can plug Derwin in different positions. Derwin can really do a lot of different things on that, on that defense. And obviously Jalen is mostly a corner and, and I mean, shit, or he's one of the best corners in the league. So, uh, but Derwin can really do a lot and I expect him to do a lot on this defense. So I think the Chargers have some safety spots that need to be uh, filled. They have another corner position. They have defensive linemen. Other than that, they're in good shape. No, but seriously, they have they have some really good pieces on the defense. They have to get some more spots on the offense. But really, this this team is shaping up to possibly uh, be better in twenty in twenty twenty one than it was in twenty twenty and even twenty nineteen. Oh, yeah. So real quick before I let you go, you're the, the GM, you're the owner, sitting at pick thirteen. What do you do? What what like what's the pick you're making? I'm going best best position available. I mean, so, is Panay or Panay and Slater yeah, uh, gone? Panay Panay's gone. Slater's okay. gone. Darisaw is there. Darisaw and Waddle is there. Smith is gone. Micah Parsons is there. Um, Horn is there. Sertain is gone. So 
Take your pick. I'm going I'm going best position available and to me or best player available. And to me, that's Waddle. I just think Waddle is too explosive. He's too good. Um uh, you know what? Dang, no. You know what? I I I'm gonna go JC Horn. I, I just think it's too they already have Keenan, they have Mike, and there's it's a really good uh it's a really good positional draft when it comes to yeah. receiver. There's a lot of very good ones. No, I'll go J.C. Horn out of uh, out of South Carolina. You know he, he knows the league. His dad was in the league for years. Great receiver. You know what he's going to bring. He's going to be dynamic. I think if you can get Patrick Sertan or you get J.C. Horn, man, you came out of this a winner already, especially with – you know what's funny? I see, JC, or I see Patrick Sertan. He reminds me a lot of Jalen Ramsey, just the build, the how big he is and everything. J.C. Horn reminds me I, – I, I can't really put a player that he reminds me of a lot, but I just think the kid's dynamic. So I would go J.C. Horn, South Carolina. I just think he's too good to pass up, and, and you really need a, you really need a corner because Michael Davis is good, yeah. but he's not a number one. Chris Harris Jr. can still ball, but he's getting up there in age. La- I'll, I'll, real quick, last year I thought, can this Chris Harris Jr. thing work? He was injured. But then he comes back, and, and – they played Buffalo and Stefan Diggs and all the receivers were held to below 70 yards each. And I thought, wow, what, what, I mean, what, there's no Casey Hayward that game. They have Stefan Campbell who gave up some plays, but then I noticed it was Mike Davis and it was Chris Harris Jr. really doing a number on them. Then they played Denver and that was the first time he was playing Denver. Man, that dude was talking so much trash. It was hilarious. Every time, like, Drew Locke would throw his way, he would hit, smack the ball. He'd push the player out of bounds, and then he'd go over to the Denver Broncos uh, sideline, and he'd start talking trash. He's like, that boy knows me. Tell him to stop throwing this way. He's going to pay for it. So I really think that Chris Harris Jr. next year, healthy, can bring something to this defense. Again, I think that Michael Davis is going to play better. I mean, play up to his contract. And then if you get a J.C. Horn in there, man, your your secondary is starting to shape up again to be one of the better ones in the NFL, especially with who you have as a head coach. But yeah, I mean, you say Waddle, and I I, I did kind of I was leaning that way, but I'm like, you know what? It's it's J.C. Horn is too good to pass up, so I'll go J.C. Horn uh, from South Carolina. Great stuff there from Fernando. Follow, uh, make sure to follow him, follow him on Twitter at Real F Ramirez. Fernando, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it, Jake. I mean, I, I, I'm at pick 13. So how many days do you have left with this? Uh, whoa. My, my math skills, uh, 20. Help me out here. Oh, you're at, you're at 13, right? Yeah, this is 13. Oh, you're 19. You have 19, 19 more. 19 there more. On, on the spot math is very challenging, but, uh, there, oh, and actually you don't really have to do 19 because there's some teams that have two first round draft picks. Well, so it, it's funny. So I'm going in order of, 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 uh, of draft picks. So at the end, I'll do the teams that don't have the first round picks. The, um, the Rams don't have a first round pick, uh, other teams. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking out, but, uh, Rams don't have Seahawks, a first round draft. Seahawks, for, Rams, ever. Seahawks. Yeah. So teams yeah. like that. So they'll be towards the end, but anyways, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, thank you all for listening, for watching here for episode 13 and I'll catch you in the next one.